thank you all for um, being here. And I see some familiar names and lots of uh, new new friends. So I welcome all, welcome you all and um, welcome your questions if you have them. Um, just a little bit about um, my book. Uh, it's a novel. Uh, it took me about 16 years to write. Um, it's written in three distinct sections. Um, it's a it's a novel based kind of on a family story about a, a, a sister's search for a missing sister. Um, so it's told in three parts, uh, the, the voice of a nurse uh, who took care of this missing child and a father uh, who gave the, put the child, institutionalized the child and then the sister who was um, uh, searching for this child and at a later date. Uh, so it takes place you know, largely in the kind of the ninth, early 19, late 1950s, 1960s, and then in the eight, 1970s and 88. So the chapter I'm going to read you is, I, uh, I got to get this box out of the way. There you go. The chapter I'm going to read you is uh, <clears throat> when the father and mother were taking the child right after uh, she was born to the institution. It's chapter 14. Mary and Bob were in sudden close proximity after weeks of moving from hospital to home and back again. Through the roar of the Buick's heater, Bob heard Mary's breathing, could see her fingers moving as she tucked the blanket around the baby, adjusted her scarf, pulled down the rearview mirror to check her lipstick. The infant murmured, shifting in her bundle of blankets. They had picked her up in the nursery, moved on to Cecil's office, signing papers for her release, papers that recognized them as parents, and papers that recognized the child as a ward of the stone home for the mentally retarded, even no negotiated the awkward moment when some fool woman stopped them, mistakenly identifying them as a happy young couple heading home from the hospital with their newborn and began to gush. Let me see the little darling. And Mary looked at her sharply and Bob said, we're in a hurry, ma'am. And they rushed past the hurt on her face and out the door to the shock of the below zero snowbound world <clears throat> and into the upholstered intimacy of the car. <clears throat> the child's face screwed up and she was about to cry when she was startled quiet by the grinding sound of the car starting. Bob was startled by the quiet, startled quiet by the grinding sound of the car starting. Bob was shifted into first, pulled away from the curb, but as he headed toward the highway that would take them up over Beaver Tail Pass to the place that would house the child for the rest of her life, he felt suddenly panicked as if he'd left something behind. He patted his pants for his wallet. His keys were in the ignition. Mary was beside him. He glanced over at the child's dish-shaped face, the slanted eyes, this was it. He had to be ready now. Mary stared stray, straight ahead, her profile etched against the frost-crusted side window, inscrutable. Bob launched the car onto the highway behind a logging truck loaded with Douglas fir correcting for the skid. They headed east into the ice-bound, unblinking morning. The road was rutted, glittering here and there with black ice. As they drove, they passed cars scattered this way and that in the ditches. An ambulance tore past them at Bonner, heading for the hospital they just abandoned. They slowed when they came to the wreck, a head-on between a Chevrolet van and a Ford truck, its load of hay now spilling across the embankment. With a shudder, Bob saw the driver's side smash flat. At Beavertail Hill, a whiteout. Bob inched the car forward. The snow blew directly onto the windshield, each flake large and hypnotizing, flying into them as if from some deep bottomless well. Bob kept moving his eyes from the rear view mirror to the road, to the side mirror, to keep from feeling dizzy, to keep from feeling he would fall into a dream and off the side of the road, a dream where the sun was shining and the road was clear and his wife was beside him glowing with a baby with rounded cheeks. When the snow cleared a moment, Bob saw in the nearby window trees that had lived a lifetime in, bent, in wind, bent and gnarled. This is a terrible storm, Mary said. It was the first time she, first thing she had said since Bridger. You can barely see the road. Should we turn back? 
No, Bob said, let's just keep moving. As if she could sense their nervousness, the baby whimpered. Her eyes opened, her face flushed red, and then her cry blossomed into the furious, bleeding, skin-crawling sound of a newborn. The windshield fogged. Bob tried to drive as he polished the glass with his leather glove, leaning close to the windshield to try to make out the shadows ahead of him. Were they cars, trucks? Were the three of them going to be crushed? Another, railroad, another road fatality like so many storms like this, family of three killed on icebound road and head on. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh. the baby kept crying, her face changing from red to light violet. <clears throat> Excuse me a minute. Mary took over, clearing the windshield. The baby grew quiet, and Mary looked down at her just as a child screwed up her face and wailed until her fist shook. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Can't you do something, Mary? He patted the bundle in Mary's arms. Shh, baby, shh. The child cried harder. It was as if their entire world had shrunk down to the sound. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. A logging truck passed them in a whoosh, immersing them in a cloud of blinding snow. The child began to scream. Oh my God, Mary said, I can't take it. The baby's cries were now desperate, two punch, her tiny face moist with tears. Bob, I'm going to lose my mind, Mary said, her voice quiet with panic. We have to stop this crying. Heart pounding, Bob turned on the blinkers and eased the car over to the side of the road, praying that someone didn't come barreling up behind them to send them into a ditch. He looked at the rearview mirror, glanced back at the road shrouded in clouds behind them. Can you be fast? He looked at Mary. Mary cradled the child in her arms, swinging her from side to side like a rocking cradle. Tiss, tiss, she said, there, there. The baby stopped and sniffed. Then Mary held up the child to her nose and sniffed. Oh, for heaven's sake, she's dirty. Turn the heat up. I've got to change her, she said. I can't believe I'm so dumb. Mary hauled out the diapers and the dry towels. She laid the baby out on the coat on the seat beside her. Her hands moved quickly to unsnap the safety pins and the wet diaper. Suddenly, the naked child was on the leather seat between them, startling with her slender blue vein body, her pink vagina, her fists curled, her blue vein legs pulled tightly to her stomach. She cried her wet brain cry and Mary was talking to her saying, now, now, it's all right. It's going to be all right. As she folded the soft clean diaper across her belly where the black stump still adorned the child's belly button, pinning up one side, then the other. She guided her arms and legs back into the fuzzy yellow sleeper, snapped it up, wrapped her tightly in the blanket adorned with red and blue and green elephants embroidered by a neighbor and set her pink cap on her head. As the smell of urine filled their car, another car appeared out of the clouds on the highway <clears throat> moving toward them. It edged slowly past, then became a dark shape disappearing into the flurry of snow, honking as if to ask, why would anyone in their right mind stop here? Mary pulled a bottle from the diaper bag, a shower gift sent over from Warm Springs by Bob's mother, crooked her arm, settled the baby, and fed her a bottle. Suddenly, mercifully, the car was filled with a rhythmic kiss of the baby sucking, her eyes flickering. They drove on, inching their way over the Garnet Mountains and across the wide plains at Drummond, where Bob had to steer against the wind. He saw the gray shapes of cows, barns, and houses in their sheeting snow, and wondered if this is how the child would remember them, dark shapes looming over her like those cars passing them on the highway. Worst I've ever driven in, Mary said finally. At least the baby's asleep. Thank God for small miracles. Elizabeth Finch Carter, Bob thought, as he looked at the child asleep in Mary's arms, her fingers relaxed, her eyes fluttering, and he felt a hand close around his heart. At the sign for the stone home just after Butte, he felt weak with relief. I feel like I've aged 10 years, Bob said. That was a hellish drive. Let's just get through this, Mary said. Her mouth was set. The child was sleeping in her arms. She sat erect in the seat next to him, but she might as well have been miles away. I never thought I would be doing this, she said. Never. You know what Cecil said, Bob replied. 
Yes, I know what Cecil said, she snapped, but I'm not Cecil. Cecil didn't just give birth and have to give up a baby now, did he? Bob skidded to a stop at the stop sign. We don't have to do this, he said. Are you changing your mind? No, Mary tipped her chin up. She looked down at the baby. She lifted her up and smelled the top of her head. Then she looked back out the window. Let's go, Bob. They passed slowly through Stone City, past a small cafe where a young girl with long braids stood in the window looking out at the snow, licking a large ice cream cone. Why wasn't she in school, Bob wondered. Why didn't she have a sweater on? The thought of eating something cold in this weather made him shiver, even inside his thick wool coat. They drove slowly, looking for a sign that would direct them to the stone home. The baby woke and began to fuss. At last, as they passed the low brick buildings of the downtown and headed out of town, they saw the entrance gate for the stone home. Mary stayed in the car, engine running with the child. Bob walked into the building, past a receptionist with large dark circles under her eyes, who turned away from him as he entered, cradling the phone under her chin, her voice, voice lowering suddenly. The room was warm, a fire crackling in the fireplace, some potted ferns, and a few landscape reproductions on the walls, the air grayed. Was he imagining that? Was it the lack of fluorescent lighting which they were putting in all the buildings now in downtown Bridger? Bob was aware of the sounds of people from other floors, murmurs, and he was relieved when a nurse dressed in white starched uniform with a white nurse's cap perched on her head came briskly down the hallway and asked him if he needed assistance. <clears throat> when Bob explained who he was and that he was looking for Dr. Otzinger, she knew immediately what it was about. Her tone softened and she asked him to wait. She asked him if he was alone or did he want to bring his family inside. I have to get my wife and child, she said, and hurried outside. Inside the cocoon of the fogged up Buick, Mary held the bottle upright as the heater hummed and the baby nestled in her arms. Bob opened the door and slid in next to him. They're ready for us, Bob said. Mary looked at him, okay. She held Elizabeth to her, pulling the swaddling blanket close around the child's face and bent down and kissed the top of her head. <clears throat> Mary pulled on her hat. She draped her coat over her shoulders and buttoned it up around the baby, the arms hanging limply at her sides. She slid across the seat, opened the door and got out. As she stood, her black hair snaked out into the wind and she bent down and hurried toward the door. In the sudden warmth of the lobby, Bob lifted the coat from her shoulders before he took off his own, hanging them on wooden hangers before he and Mary settled in large leather chairs to wait for the doctor. There was a large oak carved oak fireplace with an oil portrait of a certain Frau Holtzmeier, a benefactor of the stone home, dressed in green silk with a broad imposing chest. Bob held his hands out to the fire as it popped and crackled, his fingers tingling. The child started to cry. Mary bounced it, holding it close as she walked over to the fire and stood there swaying. She's cold, she said to Bob. Her face was drawn. He knew that Mary was telling him something. What was it? That none of this was her idea? That they had time now to change their minds, to turn around, take the baby and run? He wanted to remind her what the, about what the doctor said. He wanted to remind her about the law. He wanted to remind her about how they really didn't have much choice. In fact, when he thought about it, choice was their enemy here, black and white, right and wrong. It was a simple decision. It was the law. Mary patted the baby on her shoulder as she moved about, her galoshes squeaking. The baby's cries echoed off the walls. The beginning of a headache drummed against Bob's temples. The receptionist was talking on the phone, her lips curving red. As she laughed at something, her hand over her mouth, eyes cast politely away from them. Mary walked over and stared Bob in the face and she could, he, she, he could see her red lipstick and black hair and dark eyes. How lovely, how startlingly beautiful she was as she offered him the child saying simply, I have to use the ladies room. Okay, Bob said and stood there. That means Bob, she said, using both hands to offer him the child that you need to hold the baby. 
He reached out and took the child into the crook of his arm and listened to the dimming click of Mary's heels. Shh, shh, he said to the screwed up face, the purple vein pulsing in the forehead, don't cry. Bob smelled the child, the dewy, slightly decayed smell like overripe fruit. He saw the black hair feathering her head, the tiny purple tinged fingers gathered in a fist, the narrow eyes tilted. The child turned her eyes toward the voice. Oh God, Bob said. He walked around and around, jiggling her, feeling the bulk of her six pounds, two ounces, wriggling, the weight of a large file, Northwestern Insurance, Donatello logging. Please don't cry, Bob said, his heart pounding as he walked and jiggled and wondered where Mary was and what was taking her so long and whether she was applying her lipstick. Perhaps she was enjoying the sounds of the baby's cries ratcheting up higher and higher, cries that were building up like PSI in his brain and his skull and his spine. He glanced again at the receptionist who was also clearly ignoring him. Of course you feel that way, she cooed softly into the phone. She was so wrong to do that. Well, Bob thought, I'm not going to give her the pleasure of watching me suffer. He looked for someplace quiet, someplace he could get away, when he spotted a phone booth and headed over to it. He sat inside, folded the door shut, the baby in his lap. Okay, kid, Bob said, looking at the kid child in his arms. We're in this together. We got to make the best of it. He put the child to his shoulder and patted its bottom. The child kept crying. Ain't she sweet? She's a walking down the street. His mind went blank. He couldn't remember the words. The baby arched its back and shrieked. His mind turned red. Where was Mary? He looked out into the room. It was empty. Okay, princess, how about cigarette holder, which wags me? More crying, but a curious change in tone. Over my shoulder... He turned sideways as he patted her back, taking in the blue eyes, the flat face as he hummed a tune, jostling her to get her to stop crying. Come on, little one, you gotta love the Duke. Ha 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 ha, out stepping. The fist gripped, the body clenched as he patted the baby's flannel back. Suddenly, miraculously, Elizabeth Finch Carter hiccuped. Bob turned her over to face her, holding her along his forehead, forearm, as her eyelids fluttered, and as quickly as she was consumed with fury, she was consumed by sleep. Good girl. He placed her back on his shoulder. Good taste. When he emerged from the phone booth, the receptionist arched her eyebrows at him. The doctor will see you now. Your wife is already in there. Thank you. <laughs>